Um, if you have questions, comment in the Zoom link and I'll answer them as quickly as possible. Uh, otherwise, I'm just gonna go through the questions that have been done, um, asked already. I'm gonna answer them all and I'll let my, my crack tech team chop them up and send them to you guys with uh, when we're done. So if you have questions in the future and you're watching this now, just email us to the questions. We'll include them in the next AMA. Join the Telegram group, join the Discord group. And uh, you know, I'm happy to answer some questions. And if you wanna work with us and get everything done quickly and correctly the first time right away, obviously we provide services as well. This is just a way for me to give back and uh, help people and uh, meet new, new clients and new people anyway. So um, he says is here, what's up, man? I saw your last meeting. So I'm going to find, this is what I had. So google.com, cool. I'm gonna leave Google. I'm gonna leave Google up and leave this up. So these are the questions and I'm gonna go through, I have to share my screen. Let me put this. Let me share my screen and let's get started here. Cool. Um, cool, so question one, if my LLC incurs, that's not really a question, let me put it here. If my LLC has permanent establishment and I provide services both in the US and outside the US, should I pay taxes only for transactions in the US? How is the proportion calculated? Uh, when does it make sense to change to a C Corp? Um, an LLC taxes a C Corp. Well, this is a loaded question when you have permanent establishment. So the question is, so in the US, you pay tax on your income earned in the US if you're a non-resident. So if you're a non-resident, you're only paying tax on your income that's earned in the US. Um, if you're a US tax resident, then you have to pay tax on everything and you get a credit for what you pay taxes on outside of the US. So there's the first, the, 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 the determining where you're a resident and where you're subject to in, in income taxes. And then you have to calculate the amount of taxes you have to pay based on where the, the sourcing of the income. And there's different sourcing rules for different jurisdictions and countries. If there's a tax treaty, the tax treaty will help us determine uh, the sourcing. So um, to answer your question, if you have permanent establishment, that's a treaty term. And that's when you have some kind of connection to a country. So in a, a common example, a recent example for me, I have a, a client who installs giant movie screens and they sent over workers from their country to install them in the US per the tax treaty, because this is with, a, they, were, they were based in a treaty country. If you send over workers to perform a task that's completed in less than 90 days, it doesn't count as permanent establishment. Generally, if you send someone to a country to do some work in the country, it is permanent establishment and you're only paying taxes on the income that is earned in for that engagement, for that, for that, that deal. So that's kind of how that works a little bit. And when does it, when does it make sense to change from a, an LLC disregarded from an LLC to an LLC that's taxed as a C Corp? that's when you start to have a business so i i it's it really is case by case you know i'm not gonna there's no there's no um one answer for everybody an example for i i, I if you give me an ex, i'll give you one example when it would make sense if you have a business and you guys provide it support uh and this is common if you if there's a business that provides it support to um, from Colombia to people in the U.S. or from Jamaica to people in the U.S., you're only, and you start to come in and install stuff and do stuff physically in the U.S., uh, then it would make sense to make the corporate election and open an office and then operate the business fully as a U.S. tax-paying business. So it's really when you start to expand and fully get into the U.S. and you want to lower your chance of your risk of double taxation because if you don't do that, the owner of the LLC has to pay income taxes and that's more complicated. So, you know, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Um, if you give me more uh, very specific details, you can change like country names or whatever, if you, whatever, I can give you a more specific answer and I appreciate you being here, Sayas. Eduardo, appreciate you too. Thanks for coming. Ask a question if you want. I'm gonna go back to these questions and blaze through a couple of these. I have a single owner LLC in Wyoming. I'm a non-resident. I want to sell cosmetics. I make up 
do I have to register my products with the FDA? That's a very good question. That is not an income tax question to where I am the an expert in my eyes uh, and I have experience. I don't believe you have to register with the FDA. Um, it's not food or drugs. It's just makeup. Um, I don't believe my other clients are doing this. I really don't think so. It's, but you know what? I'm going to do uh, what I'm sure you've done already. Um, get out of this and go to Google. Do I need to register makeup with the FDA? Then. Manufacturers are not required and no registration number is required to import cosmetics into the United States. So the FDA websites, how cosmetics are not FDA approved, but FDA regulated. So, I mean, a Google search told me that you don't have to. I would, uh, I can answer complex tax questions. Google can answer <laughs> other questions and you can check the websites like these FDA websites. So, um, I hope that answers your question, my friend, with the um, makeup. It's a great business to get into. There's huge margins. A lot of people buy it. Um, I love it. I wish I knew more about makeup or had a passion for it because then I could make money doing it too. I just don't really care for makeup or hair products. Beard products are fun, but I cut my beard off tragically. So that kind of answers that question. Now I have another question from, I'm going to pop this one up and I'm going to go back to the chat, my, my guy Eduardo has a question here. Can I buy real estate in countries other than the US with my Delaware LLC? What would be the tax implications of such operations? So can, can you open or uh, can you own real estate outside the US with a US company? From the US tax perspective, yes, of course you can. There's no tax problem in the US for doing this. There's no, uh, assuming you're a non-resident, uh, there's no tax implications in the U.S. at all, and there's no problems. If you're a U.S. citizen, U.S. resident, it's also fine. Um, what I've found to be more common is to have, um, I work a lot with Belize real estate, so I have a lot of clients that buy real estate in Belize, and if you want to buy real estate in Belize uh, on an island, Burgess Key, I can hook you up. Um, there is a lot of great land there, and I have a lot of clients buying it, um, coming to me from all over the place. So if you if you want to buy something there, they have a lot of options. Um, but to answer your question, um, what a lot of clients in Belize are doing is they title it into the the, the land or the property into a, a holding company in uh, Antigua, and then they can transfer the ownership of that company. So the first thing you need to do, and I think I answered this before, is to make sure that you're following the local laws to make sure your asset is protected in the local country where the asset is located, like the land is. Um, it's the question isn't can you do it in the U.S. because you can from my from our perspective. The question is to like Mexico or or you know Greece or wherever the property is. Can you can a foreign company own it there? And what are the implications there? So this is a country by country exercise. I do have clients that use LLCs to own foreign properties, and it's great and it works fine. Um, but you really need to check locally first how that works because protecting. And I think I answered this question before protecting. And I hope, Danny, that you, uh, my guy, that you're putting this on a separate video because it's going to be a good YouTube video. People are asking. Protecting the, the your asset is the most important thing first um, and making sure you have all the rights to it because there's different um, rules of law for uh, ownership of assets in different countries. The U.S. is great. There's a lot of people doing land flipping and investing in the U.S. So that's that's it. You can from our perspective and then no problem here. And it's a good idea if you can, but you have to check locally and really dig into it locally if you can do it. Um, this is a great question too. Another follow-up for Eduardo that I'm gonna answer first because he's here. And I love it when people show up to these live, you get your questions answered right away, join the Discord, join the uh, Telegram group, which is probably better than the Discord because I actually answer it more. Um, what lines of businesses are good ideas to implement with an LLC uh, if I'm a non-resident and of the US. So basically what's a great business to operate digitally as a non-US resident uh, with an LLC? The easiest way to get started making money is a service business, trading your time for money, finding something you're good at and finding someone who needs what you do. Obviously it has to be a digital service 
but services are the best way to start. Uh, E-commerce is obviously great, um, creating brands. There's money involved in investing in that. And it's also a lot more risky. There's a lot of people doing it. It's more difficult now than it has been. But if you want to spend the time, I would learn from an expert and do that that way. Uh, there's, I have a lot of clients now doing land investing in the U.S. You buy and flip land, buy and sell land. If you're interested in this, I can refer you to a couple of different uh, coaches on this topic who are really great. Um, you can buy land over the mail, basically, in the U.S. and then resell it. I bought a parcel uh, of land before, and I still own it. It's, uh, it's like a quarter acre in West Florida. It, I bought it a couple of years ago at a great discount, and I still have it. It's worth like 10 times what I bought it for, honestly. Uh, and I'm just going to keep holding on to it until I figure out something to do with it. Um, so those are those are some ideas. It really depends what you're good at. You have to see what you're interested in, what you're good at. But really starting with a service business or some kind of uh, systemized business is the right way to do it. I mean, this is a very generic question. If you tell me what you're good at, what your background is, what you like to do, um, there's a lot of different ways. If you like to play video games, start streaming and start getting an audience and see how you can monetize stuff, do affiliate sales. Like there's a lot of affiliate stuff is great too. Um, but there's, I mean, I could talk all day on different stuff to do. So that's a great question. I hope I gave you some ideas. If you want to give me more uh, information, I'll try and give you more answers. Now, this is from my guy. I think he's here. Please comment if I'm wrong. So I'm a Jamaican citizen. I'm a gospel minister. I use the uh, um, internet to get income, but my, I want to focus on ministry. God bless. That's amazing. I have an LTD in Jamaica that has three DBAs. We don't have Stripe. I think I answered this before. Is it okay to use a US LLC to collect payments? Yes, it's perfectly great. You can open a US LLC to be owned by a foreign entity and operate it uh, however you want you can because there's no presence in the u.s you pay no tax in the u.s you basically would report it all locally in jamaica um but depending on the rules there but this llc would have a bank account a stripe account and it's all good and you can sell and do however you want to do it and then report it uh locally no problem with that at all i have a u.s paypal and a u.s stripe account for the u.s llc and the companies have different names would I need to do DBAs for the US LLC to do this? And would I have inverse application on taxes? We're using a lean startup methodology, AKA we have no money to invest in paid advice. <laughs> so I like the lean startup, AKA you're doing all the research yourself. That's great. Good for you guys. Good luck. Um, in the US, you can have multiple Stripe and PayPal accounts and you can send the money to any bank account you want. It's pretty easy. I have, uh, right now I'm doing this operation and um, I have a, a number of different Stripe accounts and PayPal accounts, and I'm sending them all to the same U.S. bank account. It doesn't really matter uh, where they're from. The only difference is, is that Stripe and PayPal will potentially send 1099K forms to the IRS in, informing them of the total sales you had with that in that account. So that's the only thing. There's no adverse implication on taxes. The only, um, the biggest uh Tax implication, you won't have tax implications until you have profits. So until you make money, there's no real tax implications anyway. So I wish you guys the best of luck with your lean startup methodology um, and that you, you know, you, you figure it out. But yeah, use PayPal, use Stripe and um, can send it all to the same bank. It's, it should be fine in the in the US and IRS eyes. I mean, I don't see why it would be an issue as long as you're properly reporting any trade or business income with a, or any effectively connected income with the US trade or business, which it sounds like you probably have done. So good luck. I think that's the answer to that one. How much do you charge for filing taxes on LLC? This isn't really a good Q&A question. It depends. The famous accounting answer. It depends on your situations and the information that you have available, the type of com company you have, um, how nice you are. Just kidding. But for really mean people, I, I, could, I do charge more because I don't want to work with them. There's no, I don't really have a guide if you want this is more of an email question. So Danny, make sure we email this person back and figure out what they have. Uh, a great option for an LLC is to check out some of my courses. I have the how to file taxes for your LLC master course. Um, well, if I don't have it, I'll have it for next year ready. Basically determine what kind of company you have and then watch the follow the guides on how to file your tax forms. It's a, uh, you know, if you're making a lot of money, it's not, a, I wouldn't recommend doing it that way. I'd recommend paying someone to do it the right way. But, you know, it's up to you. If you like to learn, go for it.
If I were to get an SSN by becoming a student and getting an F-1 visa, would that require me to start paying taxes as a resident for my US LLC? This is a tricky situation here because do I pay US taxes with an F-1 visa? And technically, in general, aliens performing services are liable for Social Security and Medicare taxes, um, but certain classes of foreign employees are not. Okay, so this is, so most of the content on here is F1 students who are, um, who are working on campus and getting a W-2. You're, you're not subject to self-employment taxes, which is great. Um, hey, 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 hey. Sorry about that, it's late here and I don't have an office. So, this is always a great question. All of the, um, technically you're not supposed to be working in the US on a, on a student visa. Technically you should be um, studying. Um, it's, it's really complicated, but, um, what happens if I get an SSN with an F1 visa, would that require me to start paying taxes? When you have an F1 visa, your days in the U S aren't considered U S days for the substantial presence test. So you are not a U.S. tax resident. However, if you're doing business while you're in the U S on this visa, that you would have a U.S. trader business and that business would be subject to income taxes. How, and it's complicated because you don't have work authorization like that. So it's a little complicated. It's both a, an immigration issue and a tax issue. Generally speaking, if you, if you just do stuff on the side of your LLC, no one's going to know. USCIS and the IRS don't communicate for, from how I understand it. So um, it's not a huge issue. Uh, I would focus on your studies and then move to... Um, and do this like kind of on the side. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily just come to the U.S. just to get a, a social. I mean, I, I would, I would focus on this too. Um, but if you're technically in the U.S. working, I, it's subject. You're subject to U.S. taxes. It's just a really muddy area right here because of how USCIS, immigration um, people, and the IRS don't really communicate about this stuff. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't scale a huge business, but I could get started, make some money on F1Bs, and not really have too much risk of getting in trouble. But technically, it would be subject to tax because you are working in the U.S. on a 1040 NR. I don't know. It's a confusing question. I have to I have to dig into it more. I'm not going to do it now. Um, yeah, but the answer is having an SSN wouldn't. Uh, you wouldn't be paying tax as a resident. You basically still just paying tax on income earned in the U.S. because you would have a trader business. What's up? I think someone just joined. If you have a question, comment. I'm answering group questions first uh, for people here alive. Um, let's put these up higher so I can move my video. If an LLC buys used phones from a consumer and sells to refer companies, they need to collect sales taxes. Did I answer this one last time? I feel like I answered this before. Do they need to collect the sales tax and or would they need a resale certificate to be exempt? You don't need to, do you need to justify that? So if you are buying goods, I, I explained this to my team uh, earlier today. I'm going to explain who needs a resale certificate and how the resale certificate works. So you need a resale certificate when you are buying goods from a U.S.-based wholesaler generally for reselling them. Sales taxes are only imposed on the ultimate consumer and the ultimate user of the uh, of the item, of the product. Sales taxes are generally only imposed on the sale of products, not on the sale of services or on digital products, on the sale of physical products. So you a resale certificate is to tell a wholesaler or someone you're buying from that they should not charge sales tax to you because you are going to resell that product to the ultimate consumer. And that's why it's called a resale certificate. So that's like the one minute explanation on how sales taxes and resale certificates work. It's, it's actually quite simple. Um, each, and now we can keep going and make it more complicated, but each state has its own rules 
uh, in regards to basically everything, but in regards to sales taxes and the thresholds of when you need to start collecting and filing um, sales taxes in those states. You need to register in a state to get a resale certificate in that state and not everyone and not every um, bit, a wholesaler who asks for a resale certificate will accept a resale certificate from any state. Sometimes they want a resale certificate from the state where they are based. And what else can I share about this? Once you register for a resale certificate, then you have to file sales tax returns in that state ongoing for uh, until, while you have it active based on how the state says you have to do it. And the last thing I wanted to note here is that for people, and this is all e-commerce, right? It's sale of products. If you're selling on Amazon or Walmart or eBay or Etsy or now Alibaba, which probably was no one um, from here on watching this, you don't need to um, really worry about sales taxes because the platform is going to withhold the taxes for you based on the shipping addresses. Actually, Alibaba is, I'm sure there's ways around it because um, a lot of them are wholesalers. And, and all those platforms, actually, if, if people give you a resale certificate, the, the platform manages all of it. So it's really great, a really big benefit of selling on the platforms. And that's basically the two-minute explanation of how sales taxes and resale certificates work. This is a great little snippet that we should turn into an article in a number of videos. How is crowdfunding, crowd investing managed for accounting purposes? Well, money that comes in would be considered a donation. Money that goes out is classified in whatever category of expenses that it comes in. Um, I don't know if it's a donation or a sale. It depends how you're doing it. If it's crowdfunding um, and, the, and there includes like a pre-order, like, like it is on the crowdfunding apps, then it's basically like a, a sale. If it's crowd investing, then it's everyone owns a little bit and it's like a, an equity contribution. So that person, they would own a little bit of the company and they would have equity and the money coming in isn't a sale. But if you're it's crowdfunding and you're actually selling something like a pre-order, then it's a sale. Um, depending on your accounting method, it's not recognized as a sale until you deliver the product. So if you do the accrual method of accounting, you can defer it until you actually deliver the product. Um, so that's probably what I would recommend. Um, it also depends on your company type and all that. So once you once you set up a crowdfunding account, you collect a lot of money. Uh, let me know and we can figure out the answer for you specifically. See the last video about the sales taxes. Sales taxes are only collected on the sale to the ultimate consumer, to the end consumer, the end user, the person who's going to put install the phone. That's the only person who's paying sales taxes. If you buy something without sales taxes and you keep it, then you pay a use tax. Much less commonly talked about and much less commonly paid, but it, it, it works in some situations. And it's better in some situations because you can defer the sales tax until you use it. Should we collect sales tax and digital products if we pass the thresholds? What would be the thresholds? The answer is, is no, generally no, unless sales taxes almost always only apply to the sale of physical products. If you're not selling a physical product, you don't have to deal with the sales taxes, which is amazing. Um, there's no sales tax on digital products. That would be a zoo to figure out how that would be collected. No one would pay that. Um, so the answer is no, and the thresholds don't matter because you don't pay that tax. On, uh, you don't pay sales tax on digital products. I have an LLC with my husband. We provide translation services in digital format. It's my understanding we should collect sales taxes for these services. Uh, I can confirm that your understanding is wrong. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't see why uh, does, and this is again, like it's make, make you feel silly. Does Texas charge sales taxes on digital services? Avalar is a good source. Texas, Avalar is good. This is sales tax software. Texas change, get the report. Texas does not impose sales tax on separate state internet access charges. No, 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 no. Comptroller, Texas, beautiful. Tax charge is another good resource, but the comptroller is the best resource. What are taxable items?
This is annoying. Um, let's do, let's try text share. Text share is a great resource. They have awesome stuff. Almost every U.S. state requires sellers to charge sales taxes on tangible property, also known as physical goods. Many states also implement sales taxes, sales and use tax on digital goods and SaaS offerings. So many services are subject to sexes 6.5% state sales tax rate, amusement, cable, creation of credit reports, using a computer for word processing, data entry production, compilation, debt collection. Wow, this is random. Insurance, laundry, motor vehicle, all charges. Escort services, <laughs> pest control, certain security, telecommunication, labor service, photography, artistry, tailors. I mean, I don't see anything about um, Nope, 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 nope. Turkish bath receives a massage or rub down. Okay. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like anything. Yeah, so it doesn't look like translation services, tax services, other random unlisted professional services um, that aren't listed here are subject to Texas sales taxes. And I hope you see this video and you stop uh, collecting sales taxes, you stop paying it, close your account. And um, many states actually have uh, a way you can write them a letter and add, get an opinion from them written as to um, if what you're doing is correct. And you can call into the state, but I mean, we're looking at the Texas website, comptroller.tex.gov, and it's pretty clear that um, what you're doing is not translating, is not listed here. So I wouldn't collect sales taxes. So that's like, do I have to pay tax? How did it, that's like, this is like, how do I determine if I have to pay sales taxes in a state? And this is basically the exercise for doing that, right? That's the title. So I'm, I'm glad I was able to get a good answer on that one. I hope you guys see this. Whoever asked me that question. Oh, Alex has a question. Sorry, I didn't see that, Alex. If someone payments come in via crypto, how should they report it for tax purposes? Well, um, it depends. If you're a U.S. tax resident, uh, it depends if they come in the name of a company that's a U.S. Com resident company. If you're a foreign person, a non-U.S. resident, and you have a, an LLC that's disregarded for tax purposes, there is no specific reporting for um, getting paid in crypto. If you are a U.S. taxpayer and you get paid by crypto, it's counted as income. And when you sell or convert the crypto, um, it's considered a, a, a capital transaction and any gain uh, real or loss realized from the change in value from the date you received the crypto to the date that you sold it would be reportable on your tax return. Again, only if you're a U.S. resident and that happens to you. So that's that's how you report getting paid with crypto, Alan. Thanks for the question. Excellent. Perfect. Thanks, Alan. I would like to know what business information must include the invoices created by my LLC. Um, if you create invoices from your LLC, there's no like invoice police. No one cares what you're putting on your invoices. It doesn't really matter. I would, for, as a business, um, <laughs> as a business person, on your invoices, you should put in the name of your company, uh, a list of the services you're going to provide, probably details as to when they're going to be provided, and uh, a way for them to pay you. That's that's what you should put on the invoice. Now I'm not trying to be. Uh, <laughs> Oh, sorry, I got iPhone. I'm not trying to be uh, 
what's the, what's the word make you feel stupid for the question is it it's a fair question because i know in other countries you need invoices in the us you don't really need invoices there's no invoice police no one's going to see them uh, via via email sometimes it's, i is i don't even send invoices just like uh I'll send an email saying what I'm going to do and how much it costs, and they can send me crypto or whatever. No invoices needed. As a non-U.S. citizen and non-resident, is it possible to purchase a personal boat with my LLC and register under the Delaware flag? If so, what are the benefits? What are some? If I do some charters, are the tax more reportable? So here is the only issue I see with doing it this way. Um, potentially, you'd be subject to Delaware sales taxes. If you if you if you um buy a boat with your Delaware LLC, if you buy it um from someone who sells to Delaware, they potentially would charge you sales taxes in Delaware. So you need to focus on who's gonna, where they're going to charge you sales taxes. Um, I don't see there's as as long as you're not doing business in the U.S., it doesn't really matter uh, where you are um what you're doing. But there's actually a really good case about boats. Um, you know, can we're asking, can I register my boat under a Delaware company? The two issues with this are that one potentially sales taxes you'll have to pay in Delaware if the boat's delivered to Delaware. Um, I'm not sure how that works. I did it, I've done these studies with airplanes and one with boats. And then there's one example in in tax court that I I don't I can't cite the the name of the case, but Basically, a, a Monaco boat company um, came to a boat show in Miami, and they sold a boat in Miami for whatever ten million dollars. It was a, I would call it a ship, right? And uh, because they didn't file a, an eleven twenty F, the IRS taxed them on the on the boat because they sold it in Miami. They brought it to Miami and sold it in Miami, so it was subject to U.S. income taxes. And because they didn't file a protective tax return. Uh, the IRS didn't allow them to claim the the cost of the boat against the the selling price, so it was a huge disaster for that company, and they lost, and they went to court, and it was a big issue. I don't have the case. If you guys really want to know that case, I can look it up, and we can analyze it. That'll be a good one, Danny. Put a reminder. Let's analyze that case. Um, uh, I think that'll be really great. The one about the boats, and then we can do a couple other ones. Um, but that's that's the issue. Is if you sell it while in the U.S you might have US income tax issues. I mean, generally, if you're doing stuff outside the country, uh, you wouldn't pay any tax in the US, but it's um, you know, it's an issue. If you sell it from it while it's in another place, then you wouldn't have capital gains in the other place. It's just, it's just selling it like on a dock in, in the US is, would be potentially subject to US taxes. And I think there's a case precedent for that being subject to US taxes. So, um, this might be worth like a, a paid consult so I could dig into this. I'm not doing it right now.